We're going to look at the book of Mark, the 14th chapter, one of my favorite stories of all the Bible. But I really, I don't want to focus on people here today. We're going to focus on an object. But I really want to look at this for just a moment. If you could turn with me again to Mark 14, we're going to read 3 through 9. If you're there, will you please say amen? If you didn't bring your Bible and you're going to look along with the screen, somebody say amen. All right, let's go. Sounded like the same volume. I don't know about that, but let's go. Mark 14, 3 through 9 says, And while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table, we know who he is, don't we? It's Jesus. In the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. And some of those who were present were saying indignantly to one, in, to one another, saying, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured a perfume on my body before him to prepare me for my burial. And truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of of her i want to talk to you on a thought very basic this morning asking for the lord to anoint this earthly vessel simply entitled lessons from a bottle lessons from a bottle we ask the lord to anoint me today father we ask you today i confess with my mouth the lord i am the least of all saints father lord that the gospel has nothing to do with me other than the fact that i am willing to preach it god i know that lord jesus that you Use me in spite of my faults and my strengths bring nothing to the table. But I pray today, Father, that your anointing be with us, that you would strengthen us, encourage us. Father, let your Holy Spirit be in the house and we'll give you glory and honor. And all God's children said, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I can't help but think about how Simon the leopard's house became a university of godly living that day. Uh, of, uh, sorry, of godly learning. Why do I say that? Think about that. Because in that house, there was plenty of people you could have learned from. First of all, you could have learned from the, ever, the greatest teacher that had ever lived in Jesus Christ. We know the knowledge he possessed. We know what he could have brought to the table. I, I, I'm certain that a few minutes with Jesus could change your life. Then you had Lazarus. Now think about what Lazarus brings to the table. Imagine the spiritual knowledge you can glean from a man who spent four days in paradise, four days dead. Imagine the stories that could be told. Imagine the insight. We wouldn't be able to write enough, or fast enough to keep notes. Then you had the disciples. I mean, yeah, they, 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 you, some consider them underlings, but they had tons of things they could teach us. In fact, they do. They, they would go on to write many books in the Bible and change the world. You've got Martha that could tell us about a servant's heart. It, 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 however, all the people we can learn under that roof, there was something else that could teach us something great, and it was something that you would not ordinarily choose. It's not something that we really focus on in this story. We focus on Jesus and Martha and Judas and Simon. But what if I told you that we can learn a lot today simply from an object that is this bottle all that knowledge under the roof and yet it's the bottle that can give us a lesson let me stay, set the stage for you we just read it jesus is at the table and we know it because pastor jonathan preached a beautiful sermon on it not too long ago probably six months eight months and and, and he's at the table when mary comes in with this bottle and she breaks it open and anoints jesus and she she, she cries over his feet and, and, and washes them with her tears and dries them with her hair. And, and, and she takes this bottle in to Jesus. I want to change gears here a little bit today. And I want to focus on this bottle. And I want to tell you what this bottle is. Because this bottle is this folk, it represents something we need to know. We need to focus. And furthermore, we need to get straight because there's some things that's been twisted about it in today's world. You know what this bottle is? This bottle is worship. Worship. Do you know worship is the reason why we're here? Do you know why Satan hates you? You may not even know this. Do you know why Satan hates you? 
First of all, it's because he hates God and you're made in his image. But number two is because before Satan's fall, he was one of the three archangels that was used to lead worship. And after his fall, God created us. And it's now that we lead worship unto God. Worship is important. Worship is imperative. Worship is the reason why we're here we got to understand it was worship. Why was it worship? It was worship, number one, because it cost her something. See, nowadays we've got worship mistaken. Worship is something we do when we like the song. Worship is something we do when the atmosphere is just right. When the temperature is set right where we want it. When it's the right day, the right lineup, and the right moment. But I want to tell you something, friend. Worship, true worship, has got to cost you something. You know, David that said, I- I'm going to sacrifice unto God, and he went to buy some cattle, and the man said, you're my king. I'll give you the cattle. And David said, no, sir. I will not worship and give a sacrifice that cost me nothing. It takes worship to lift up holy hands when times are going bad. It costs you to live a holy life to be able to raise up those holy hands. Worship is something that's not about me. It's not about the song. It's not about the church. It's not about the preacher. It's about an omnipotent, all-power, all-knowing God that we will say, God, We lift you up and we worship you from our heart. It's got to cost you something. It causes a change. It stirs a response because we know she wept. I don't know what I'm facing in today's church, but you know what I, I notice about today's church? We like our worship when it doesn't elicit a response. We like a cookie cutter worship where people who look the same, smell the same, lift up their hands at the same time, go through the same motions at the same point, and do it together. But I want to tell you sometimes, friend, worship will elicit a response. Sometimes it'll get you going. Sometimes it'll get you weeping. Sometimes you can't have the strength in your feet to stand, and other times you know what? You got so much energy, all you can do is dance. Worship. True worship will elicit a response. If you don't believe me, ask blind Bartimaeus. If you don't believe me, ask the apostle Peter. If you don't believe me, ask Paul and Silas. If you don't believe me, ask King David. If you don't believe me, ask Daniel. There's going to be a time when we worship, when we don't praise, but we tap into worship that it elicits a response. And you know what is even better in these last days? God says, I will inhabit the praises of my people. When you worship God, you know what you do? You create the room that you're in into the throne room of God. He moves his throne and he inhabits the praises of his people. There is a response. The question is, are we worshiping enough to get that response? But here's where it really comes. Look what she does. Look with me in verse 3. The Bible says, she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now, why is that important? I I got to thinking about this. I'll show you. I look at 1 Samuel 10 and 1. It says, Then Samuel took the flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has the Lord not anointed you ruler or king? You see, what she was doing here in the midst of everybody, everybody was treating him like a teacher. Everybody was treating him like a leader. Everybody was treating him like somebody powerful. But do you know what worship is? True worship is, is when you treat yourself like a servant and you treat Christ like a king. But yeah, y'all can get me worked up this morning because I know I just said a bad word, servant. We've propped ourselves up and that's why we can't worship nowadays. We're big deals. Look at us. We wear the best clothes. We're awesome. We're on our job. You know how many people answer to us? We're a big deal. We want, we give this facade on Twitter and Facebook about how we have the perfect life and we're perfect people and we all build ourselves up. But if you, those are in the house that understand what worship is, true worship is, is when I start treating myself like a servant, when I humble myself, when I bring myself down low, 
low and I start bringing himself high. Because I want to bring it to you right this morning, church. Let me tell you, Christ isn't your homeboy. Christ isn't your best friend. Christ isn't these things. He isn't the next best fat. He isn't some great teacher. He isn't a carpenter. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And if he's anything else in your life than a risen king and a king that you've lifted up, then maybe your worship is wrong. He is not my friend. He is not my equal. He is the one that the angels cry holy, that the demons know his name in free. He is the creator of the universe. He is the one that the earth is his footstool. He is the one that will blot out the sun in Revelation because he himself is brighter than the sun. He is the king of kings, and we should lift him up. We should raise him up. That's what she does. She does this to him, and she lowers herself. But that's the problem today. See, we have got to learn that when we crown Christ king, it enables him to act as king. Why is that important? Have you ever seen a ruler enter a room? The atmosphere changes. Those who are sitting, stand. Those who are standing, kneel. Those who are silent, clap. Those who are still, clap. Those who are silent, shout. It gives us a change. You can't help but bring it. But when you enable Christ to be king, but what she does to enable to do that is she humbles herself. However, you have to elevate Christ by humbling yourself. Now, this is what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is because we struggle in our worship. People struggle in their worship, and what I hear in them, and I always hear the same things, and you can say it however you want to say it, but it boils down to the same problem. They say, I'm not comfortable to do what the Bible says. I, I, I feel like people are watching me. I, I feel like this, and I feel like that. Do you know why people can or won't worship? They can debate with you all they want, but the real reason is this. They are unable to humble themselves. They are unable to humble themselves. You cannot worship Christ truly until you humble yourself. This woman takes her bottle, her humble bottle, to all these people and humbles herself. But in this story, you know what I noticed? The ones that were blessed that day, it wasn't the person who owned the house. It wasn't the person who was serving the food. It wasn't the disciples. It wasn't the leaders. The person that was elevated and blessed that day was the person who humbled themselves and got at the feet of Jesus and wept on his, or his feet and anointed him with the one thing that she had that was precious in her life. Friend, I'm just telling you, if you want to worship, you've got to be able to humble yourself. You've got to be able to say, God, I'm going to be low, and Father, I want you to be high. Now, I don't want you to think that I, I, I'm preaching at you and, and I, 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 this is something I've dealt with. I'll, I'll tell you this quick story. We was at prayer conference, oh gosh, probably 10 years ago. And I was sitting here and I was in the service and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, get out in that aisle and dance for me. And I wish I could tell you I did that night. I didn't. Pride got a hold of my heart. These are my peers. What are people going to say? People are going to look at me. People are going to do this. And I didn't do it, church. And I left that day so defeated. And for three weeks, I felt that small because I couldn't humble myself to worship the way David did. Do we not have things worth dancing about? Has God not done things, given us a victory worth dancing about? I, I failed miserably. And I'll never forget it. We were at a point in our ministry where we were hitting a brick wall. It's hard to get people to come to a church nine miles outside of a city that has 7,000 people. We were struggling. We were dealing with some demographics. It was hard. We were having this one Sunday night service. And I sat there and I had been praying. I said, God, don't ever let me miss an opportunity to worship again. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, dance for me. But to be honest with you, I could only hear the syllable duh before I was out in the aisle. And I ain't going to lie to you. I danced in such a way. Now listen. I danced in such a way that it offended some people. I lost two families over it. Hey, it's okay. 
I'm telling you, worship will elicit a response. But I want to tell you, something happened that night. We couldn't get a young family. I had a church. This is an honest-to-God true story. We had a church that the youngest family when we got there of 60 was a grandparent. That was my young family because they had just had a grandbaby. That was the young one. We couldn't get young people, no matter what we did. They'd show up and they'd leave. Just couldn't do it. But I worshiped God and I, I said, God, it's not about me. I, I want to be able to worship you. The very next Sunday, when I walked out to preach, we had four visiting families. They were all young families. They all came back because they saw the other ones and they all thought they all went to the same church and we picked up three of the four and from there revival sparked off and in three months our church doubled. What are you trying to tell me? Worship, true worship can change an atmosphere. This woman did it with her bottle. You can do it with your praise. You can do it with your worship. You can look at somebody and you can be worried what they might say, but who are you here to please? Are you here to please your neighbor? Or are you here to please your risen? And Savior who died for you. Don't be ashamed of him on this earth or he'll be ashamed of you in heaven. And that's what we can learn from this lady. We can learn these great and powerful things. But this is where I want to show you. We looked at that response that person gave. You're going to elicit a response. Look at verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste? There's going to be some people that talk and say that that don't seem necessary. Matter of fact, just on your hand up, what is waste? It's giving more than necessary. That's what I hear a lot in churches. Is that really necessary? Is that necessary? Is it necessary to raise your hand? Do you have to shout every once in a while? Do you have to sing? Do you have to weep? Too many churches. The people in church today are going the same thing that was going on in Mary's day. That's not necessary. Is it, do you have to shout? Do you personally, do we have to have someone do that? Do we have to? Do we have to? But what you're realizing without what you're not realizing is that you're saying, not really saying, is that necessary? You're saying he's not worthy of it. Because that's exactly what Judas was saying, he's not worthy of that. You're saying he's not worthy of it. But let me break it down for you right now, okay? No, we don't have to shout. No, we don't have to dance. No, we don't have to get in the spirit. No, we don't have to raise our hands. And no, we don't have to get happy. But since when did have to have anything to do with it? I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I want to. I don't do it because somebody told me I need to. I do it because I knew where Jesus found him, and I know where Jesus is taking me. I know those times the doctor said it couldn't be done, and Jesus did it. I know when I had a need that couldn't be met, and Jesus met him. I do what I do, not because I have to. I do it because my heart cries out to my Savior that you are too good, and God, I must worship you. Come on, bless the Lord in this house. So let's look at three quick lessons, and I'll get down here with you. Sometimes y'all don't feel like I'm preaching unless I'm down here. Amen. Let's look at three lessons from a bottle. Number one, I want you to understand it's not about the bottle. We, we get focused on this. It's, it's not about the bottle. Think about this. Of all the things that Jesus calls us, and he calls us a lot of things, but the one I want to focus on is this. He calls us a vessel. But you know what Corinthians calls us? It's on your hand. He, in Corinthians, the writer calls us jars of clay. We're vessels, fragile vessels. Clay, that's not really a good vessel, is it? I mean, when we think it, who would rather have a gold vessel? Come on, somebody. A gold chalice. We put your chocolate milk in and drink it. Amen. We want silver, gold, platinum, diamond. But he, he says, we are vessels of clay. There's a lot I know about this story, but one thing I do know to be true, when she walked in with that jar, nobody said, wow, what a great jar. The jar wasn't what was valuable. It was what was inside the jar. 
that was valuable. See, let me just talk to somebody right now today. Is your jar ain't nothing special. You're broken. You're dinged up. You're rusty. You're grimy. You're dirty. You don't even have a twist-off cap. You got one of them little one-time break-all seals. We're just this broken vessel, chipped, put away, and we look at it and we say, how can God use me? There's some people in here, the enemy has convinced you you're not valuable simply because you don't like the way your jar looks. You're not good enough and you're not smart enough and you don't look like, you look at all these other pretty vessels and then here we are. These little pivy pots. I know who I'm talking to. I know who I'm preaching to. I'm preaching to some jars of clay. Guess who's preaching at you? A jar of clay. I've been chipped. I'm not pretty. My jar is more like a jug. I realize these things. I don't know what y'all are laughing at, but don't feel funny to me. I realize. Let me just talk to those today that you've convinced yourself you're not valuable because of the way the jar looks. Who did Jesus choose? Tax collectors, fishermen, reprobates, zealots. All these people. He didn't choose them because the vessel looked good. I'm here to tell you, your vessel might not be great, but what's valuable is not the vessel. It's what's inside the vessel. Because remind me what happened when what was in the vessel got out. When what was on the inside got out, the room changed. The atmosphere changed. In fact, Jesus himself declared, they'll remember this all through eternity. As long as there is a gospel, they'll remember because what was on the inside got out on the outside. Honey, let me tell you, Christ's way, we are a pretty good-looking bunch. We got a good-looking building, and yes, we got some good-looking people, and you got a good-looking pastor. But what is going to make a change is not how we look, it's what's on the inside. I'm t- I was kidding about being a good-looking. Y'all look at me like I'm being serious. Come on, that was a joke. What is on the inside is what's valuable. The question is, how do I get what's on the inside on the outside? It's time that if we can get to the place where we can let our worship bring us to the altar, where our worship bring us to the feet of Jesus and say, God, let what's on the inside come up. I might not look like much. Let me preach to you. We might not look like much, but when we lay our hands on the sick, What's on the inside gets on the outside, and you find out there's more to this vessel. We might not look like much, but if you get to the lost person, and you let what's on the inside get on the outside, you take someone and snatch them from the gates of hell and put them on the streets of gold for all of eternity. There's something on the inside that can change. We've just got to get it on the outside. We're valuable, friend. We're valuable. you just got to get what's on the inside out to stop knocking you. Stop knocking your marriage because of what it looks like. Stop knocking your house because of what it looks like and the car that you drive. Stop worrying about coming here and what kind of clothes that we got on because this vessel means nothing. This building means nothing. What changes is what's on the inside gets on the outside. There's something on the inside of you. He said, I've sealed your hearts. I've put a deposit of the Holy Spirit into you to let you know that I am coming again. There's some greatness on the inside of you. You might not feel like much, and you might not look like much, but that ain't going to stop the fact that what's truly of value has been put inside of you. You have just got to say, God, bring it out of me. Can you put your hands together and bless the Lord in this house? So my question is, how do we get what's on the inside out of us? Who wants to know that? Three people. Great. I feel so encouraged in the house this morning. Who wants to know how to get the inside on the outside? Okay. You're not going to like the answer. Point number two. A broken bottle is not always bad. She had something valuable, but in order for the value to come out, the bottle had to be broken. I wish I could sit here and tell you life's going to treat you great. You ever heard that old saying? That when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. What are you going to do if life gives you lemons and no sugar? 
What are you going to do if life gives you a rotten lemon? What do you do with those? Life's going to be unfair to you. Life's going to hit you, and it's going to hurt. How do I know these things? Because we know. We know that Peter lost, Apostle Peter lost his wife. We know that Jesus himself lost his earthly father, Joseph. We know that tragedy is going to take place. We know that James was executed by the evil King Herod. There's going to be things happen in which you find your bottle broken. And that's what took place here today, is this bottle was broken. There's going to be times in our lives where we will find ourselves broken. The question is, what will we do? You've got to understand a broken bottle is not always bad. Uh, in order to get the perfume out, she had to break it. Sometimes in our life, to get what's on the inside out, we have to be broken. Do you think David would have learned to have been king if he would have just went from defeating Goliath right into the throne? Or did he learn in the cave of Abdullah? Or did he, he learn on the ashes of Ziglag? Did he learn when he was broken how to deal and these things that came out of him? I told my, somebody this week, I said, the human body is built that way. You understand that? Do you know how you get antibodies? By getting sick. Do you know how you get muscles? When you lift, this is true. When you lift, you know what you're literally doing? You're tearing muscle. That's why you're sore the next day. You're literally, your body is tearing itself. It's stretching. And then it builds it back stronger to say that won't happen again. Sometimes, in order to get what's on the inside out, we have to be broken. Bad things have to happen. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. The jewels of a Christian are his or her afflictions. We don't like to look at those bad things, but it's the bad things that bring them out. In order to get that bottle working, she had to break it. But look with me in John 12 and 3. When she broke it, look what happens. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The house changes. That tells me two things. Number one, when your worship gets to the point, the fragrance of Christ cannot be hidden. Nobody was in that room and didn't smell it. Her worship to Christ caused a change. It cannot be hidden. And I know we live in a day and age where they tell us we can't have Jesus, we can have any other person, but we can't have Jesus in our schools, on our work, anywhere. But can I tell you something, friend? Your worship will break open an aroma of Christ that they cannot stop. Amen. It cannot be hidden. I, 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 they, they, they tried to put Christ in the background all you want, but when this bottle breaks open, you cannot help it. Your worship creates a fragrance even the dullest spiritual noses will pick up on. There is a fragrance that can change the atmosphere. I'm telling you, friend, you can't keep Christ hidden. You can do your absolute best, but what's on the inside will get out. There will be a time that even when you break open your worship, that the, even the dullest noses will smell it. And then number two, when you're broken and your worship breaks and, there's a, and you're broken, it will still leave a residue. Here's what I like to think. What about the people that come into this house after this dinner party? What in the world happened in here? Anybody ever smell that person that puts on way too much cologne? You know what I'm talking about? You smell them coming before they even show up? Cologne can leave a residue. There, there are people that I know I can tell have been in a hallway just because I can smell their fragrance. It leaves a residue. Here's, here's what I, 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 I break it down to you this way. There's a local gas station, and I'm not knocking this, okay? Please, I'm not being funny. I'm not making a joke. I'm just telling the truth. They have a lot of incense in this gas station. I mean a lot. Um. And you walk in and you smell it, and I'm sure there's a reason for it. But I bought a bag of pork rinds. And I took my pork rinds home, and the bag smelled like it. Now, I'm sure this was a placebo effect. But to me, they even tasted like it. Now, what am I trying to tell you? A fragrance leaves a residue. It, you can tell somebody's been there. When you worship, you 
you can tell somebody, I know you're looking at me like you think I'm crazy or I'm making a wild point, but do you remember when Moses was on top of the mountain? I got it up here on Exodus for you. It says when Moses came down from spending time with God, carrying the two stone tablets of the covenant, he wasn't aware of it. But his face became radiant because he'd been spending time with the Lord. He didn't know it, but there was a residue on him. Maybe you like it in the New Testament. Acts tells me like this, that the apostles were preaching so hard that they would take it and they would give them a, some, a, 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 a cloth and the aprons and, and handkerchiefs and merely touch their skin and gave it to the sick and they laid them on the sick and the sick was healed because of the residue. I'm telling you that when you get along with God, and you begin to worship him and to cry out and to be broken in his presence. There is a residue that can get on you that you don't even know it's there. Moses didn't know it was there. Matter of fact, I'll put it to you this way. Brother Craig just had surgery a year ago. He is still here today. He has got past with the Lord's help with, with, with cancer. But how many people, there were several families. I, I know Kristen, you can ask Kristen and Ezekiel. She was there and, and, um, and Tony and Stacy and a bunch of other people were there. And I'm telling you, I, I, I had walked in. And it's not about me. I promise you it's not. I'm just making a point. I can't tell your stories. I can only tell mine. And I was walking down the hallway, and we were talking, and a woman stopped. Now, I wasn't wearing a suit and just said, my goodness, I'm drawn to you. There's something different about you. And she said this. And she was an older woman, so don't get no ideas. Can I just give you a hug? And I sat there, and I hug, hugged this, this woman, and I loved on her. Now, I didn't say a word to her. It's not about the vessel. I can sit here and preach to you all the bad things about the vessel. I'm just here to tell you, when you spend time with God, you don't know it, but there's a residue on you. You walk by, and what's in the physical will affect the spiritual. You, I, I'm telling you, they can kick prayer out of schools. Pray before you go to school. You'll do more damage with the residue on you than any you can do with any pamphlet or Bible study. Get on your knees. Spend some time with God. You'll find out there will be a change. You just got to get to the point where you say, come on, let's go. I'll never forget, I, I had a service. I was broken before God. I mean broken. It was about the time we had the worst tragedy of my life at camp meeting, and God had spoken to me there. I left my jacket. I, I dressed differently when I go out to eat because I spill food all over me all the time, and it cost me a lot in dry cleaning. But I was sitting there with some church members at Outback eating cheese fries. You can't look anointed eating cheese fries. It's impossible. <laughs> Honest to God, this woman stopped went backwards and said, I don't know, but my heart tells me that you're a man of God. And I just need prayer. And I, my life's not going right. See, that's the way the gospel works. You don't have to preach it. If you'll pray it, God will work it out for you. You've just got to get to the point where you say, God, break me. Do what you got to do in me, but just get what's on the inside out of me so that I can make a change in the room that I'm in. Come on and bless the Lord in this house. I'm going to leave you with this. It's point number three. There is someone greater than the bottle. Here's what's interesting about this story. This story is very, this, you know how much this perfume was worth? It was 300 denarii. A denarii is a day's wages. So it was worth a little over, or right at, a year's worth of salary. She had been holding on to this bottle. I need you to see the importance of it. I got to thinking and began to study why someone have a, something so expensive. Then I uh, found some things. This was her dowry. This was her chance at a better future. This was her chance to entice a husband. Especially we know that she might need that help. This was her opportunity. She knew Jesus was about to die. She burst that bottle at his feet. Now let me drop two things on you that will make it even more precious. Who's eating at the dinner with him? Lazarus. That's her brother. Remember, he died. She held on to the bottle. She could have broke the bottle the day Lazarus died. She didn't. The second thing, this isn't Martha's house this time. This is Simon the leper's. This wasn't, I got caught up in the moment. Let me run to my bedroom and get my bottle. She showed up that day ready to go. 
premeditated. I know what I'm doing. I didn't get talked into it. I didn't get emotional and in, in did it. I showed up. She took her bottle, which was so precious, which represented something better for her life. And she made a conscious effort to break it and anoint the head of Jesus. Some of us will never be able to truly worship like we need to because we're too busy clinging to our bottles. We're trusting in something else. We're holding on. I really believe that's why we don't see miracles as much nowadays. Because as medicine has grown and and, and money has grown and all these other things have grown, we depend on too many things where back in the day we were just went, God, if you don't do it, I don't know what's going to happen. We depend on the bottles and we're not willing for them to be broken. Don't cling to your bottle, friend. For that marriage to be fixed, you might just have to break it. You might have to break your pride. You might have to break that thing you've been holding on to. You might have to break that past. You might have to let go. For God to do that miracle, you might have to stop clinging to the bottle and say, God, one more time, I know you're greater than the bottle. Let me let it go. You will not be able to experience true worship until you realize there is one more important than the bottle in the house. Will you stand with me, friend?